Yeah, we've always been on the land here. Um, we now have country just outside of Burke, um, and my, two of my brothers are still on that, and I still live on there. Um, until very recently, we were all involved as a family, but with my dad's passing, we sort of eased off a little bit, and we sold a little bit of the, the farm to so that we could keep the rest of the farm. Um, like a lot of farmers out here, we were in the grip of the banks, as it were. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'm driving to Yandabula, which is um, two and a half to three hours northwest of here to go and see a family. I uh, will take communion out when I go. Um, and hopefully they will have a couple of people from neighbouring properties that will come in to join us. Um, that was something that, that came out of a talk that I had with the property owner, and she said that, you know, that she would really appreciate that, so that's really good. Um, normally on a Wednesday I would go to Brewarrina and we have at this point in the year a Lenten group and we have play group um, with the young mums. On Mondays I sometimes go to um, Angonia where we have a play group and the preschool and I meet the mums from the properties that bring their kids into the preschool. Um, I also have a connection with the Indigenous community out there through the MPREC which is the local job provider. and. Um, yeah, it's, it's great just meeting people, making connections and hopefully make, building the network back to parish. It's been a time of, um, I want to say change, but it's been uh, huge in a way because when I was younger, when I was young, um, you had families that went to Mass, you had um, the Catholic ball, you had the Catholic tennis team, you had, you know, you had, you had um, a social life that revolved around being Catholic and part of, and that was very much part of the parish. And I think um, through different sorts of changes, whether it was, you know, just, just time, I think, think the church takes a long time to catch up to the change that's happened in society. And while I don't think it should change necessarily because society changes. I think there are things that have happened in the church that have pushed people out um, or, or disencouraged them, discouraged them, that's the word I'm looking for, discouraged people from, from attending. And I think once people stop coming and they lose the habit of being part of something, um, it tends to lose meaning in their lives and they replace it with something else. And I think that's pretty much what most people have done. Mm. I think people are still people um, and they still have the need to know that they're not alone. I think they still have the need to know that, that they're part of a bigger plan. Um, I think they still question <laughs> all of those things. I don't think any of that's changed. I think their response to church has. Um, they don't see the, um, the need, I suppose, for the formal rituals. Um, I'm a big believer in rituals. I think in their in their quieter moments after the event, they do they do see the need. Um, I was only talking to someone this morning about um, funerals, and um, and a lot of people. The first thing they say to us, "No, we'll just have a quick one, just a quick one." You know, don't get over and done with. You know, and it was a graveside service today in a local funeral, and I said how sad I thought that was because. Um, a couple of years ago, I was doing funerals um, when we didn't have a priest, and um, that, I always thought the graveside services were the most sad that I had ever done because this person had obviously lived, they'd spent time on this earth, and five minutes, and they were in the ground all over Red Rover. And, um, and I know that after the event, when I'd spoke, I've spoken to family members after that, I think they were sorry that they did that, you know, that I think it's really important that there is ritual in our lives, but what that ritual looks like, I think is probably changing for people. Mm. The and country people are very good at, at um, creating community. They're, they're very good at that, um, just because of survival as much as anything. I think when you've got people that live through a, a thin wall, you, you tend to be more caring about your privacy. Um, but. I just think to survive. I mean, the, the environment itself, to live, to live where they live, it's a day-to-day -day thing. You wake up in the morning, what's the weather like? Is it going to be dust? Is it drought? Is it rain? 
if it's raining, does it mean I can't get to the back paddock? You know, is the ball running? Am I going to come out with a, you know, have a dam full of dead animals? Or, you know, whatever it might be. It's every day is, um, is a challenge just, just with the environment itself. So to be able to survive that, I think, I suppose there's a, a certain amount of pragmatism is called for. But, but yeah, I think um, if you speak to any of them, they, there's a mention. They, they feel it, and even the blokes that can't articulate it, you know, they'll they'll talk about, um, you know, the sunset. You know, you know, how yeah, they get the colours. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Or they'll, or their wives will show you the photos and things like that. And you know yourself when you've driven, if you've driven around out here, it is a special place. But I think um, we hear a lot about um, place being important to people, and I think. For a lot of these people out here, land is important to them. It, it is part of who they are, the very dirt and the pores, as it were. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's God by another name. We have, we're lucky, we've got a few that name it that, but a lot of people just know it's bigger than them, that it's awesome. Um, and they have a strength, I suppose, that, that they get from knowing that it's not just them. People in the country probably have um, a better idea of the stillness, the grandeur, just because that's what they're living in every single day. But also that knowing that you can't control everything, that just take the time. It'll it'll happen. It'll sort itself out. Just have faith. You know, it'll it'll work. And and I think we can all take a lesson from that. You can be more isolated, if possible, in a city than you can, you know, 200 k's west of here. Um, these pe- the people in the, the remote, remote rural areas have so much to offer. Those of us that are more urban, <laughs> I think we tend to get so busy in our lives that we can't see past our side fences um, or the car window sometimes. Um, but I think, I think that just the sense of... Um, urgency is not in the rural areas there that um, day to day I've got so much to do I've got to you know blah 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 Um, they don't have that to the same extent that town people do Mm -hmm. and I think um, and I also think they've got a better idea of the bigger picture too you know the, the idea of community of what community what's important about community um and I don't think it's just um, knowing what your neighbour's up to, I, I, you know, the latest Facebook thing or something like that. I mean, it's a great way of people connecting, but it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's the support. It's being of support. It's putting yourself out for your neighbour, literally. And um, I think that's a good lesson for the rest of us. Mm. I think people could benefit from interacting with country people, I think they just listening um, to country people to see to see what they see spirituality as, and I think I think they would benefit firstly because they would realise that they're probably not too different, but secondly that that it just looks different for different people. Um, there is no doubt that living in a city, you have as big a spirituality as in the next person. But your experience of that will be very different to somebody, say, at, at, you know, Wenaring or Hungerford. Um, and you, I think that that we learn best from each other, rather than being told or reading about it. I think we learn best from each other. And whether it's visiting or listening, I think that, yeah, I think we've we've got a bit to learn from each other. Thank you, Marianne, again, that's just um, another story that's just so full and so rich, so packed with um, observations, little signposts about what might be helpful when we talk about a spiritual life. And as we said when we started, it's, it's not that, um, that anyone is here to tell anyone what it means to have a spiritual life. It's, it's about hearing what 
comes from these stories and, and discerning together something of what um, we can put together and piece together that helps us understand what it might mean to grow in holiness and, and have a spiritual life. Um, I'm going to start us off because I know we need to start somewhere um, with a question to Mary Ann because it's fresh in my mind. It just hadn't occurred to me until I saw the story again. Um, you made a, an, a comment about control. You know, people uh, recognise they're not in control in the country and it makes me wonder whether that's something um, that might be really important for a spiritual life to, to be able to let go of controls. And is there something about the country that makes that more possible, do you think? I think every time you open your eyes, if you live in the country, you're not in, you know you're not in control. I mean, you've only got to look out the window. Um, just because the radio tells you that it's going to be rain today, you know, unless it's on the ground, it's not going to happen. Um, I think it, it's more in your face. In, in rural areas, you are dependent on your surroundings. And so every day, literally, you are not in control. You, you know just f for having to live in the environment that you're not in control. Thanks, and there's something I, I remember um, being told, you know, in a, in a moment of desperation to remember that I wasn't in control. And it's a paradox because we, we do need to take control sometimes in order to put order in. And, and Johnny sort of probably helped us with that a little bit in terms of, you know, quietly deciding you needed help, you take control of your life a little bit to take it to someone else to get the help. But ultimately the paradox is we're in control but not in control. And there's something I think, um, significant in that. I'm wondering whether maybe Bishop has something to say about control. <laughs> Where do I get it? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Um, uh, it, it's interesting, the, the control and, and being controlled, not out of control, and, and the paradox. It's, it's, it's a way that you, you think about things too. It's a lot to do with a person's philosophy, I think that if you uh, are a person that has an idea and then you want to force that idea on your environment around you, then you're going to get let down out here. In, in a more urban environment, you've got technology to enable your will to be done. It's at your fingertips. You press that, that'll happen. You ring that. Yes, you get online, get the Google, find that, get your car. You know, it's going to take 20 minutes to get from there to there, get the work. It, a lot of it's more predictable because I think technology allows more control. We like to have things that we can rely on, don't we? I mean, we do. Like, you know, fast food, everything. You get out and into the bush, then you don't have that. To a certain degree, we'd all like it, but you know, I, I take I, I took a couple of bishops out for a drive out in the bush, and they're they're on their their mobile phone getting their emails to do that. And I said, well, do it quick. You've got five minutes of uh, you won't be doing any emails for another two and a half hours. Um, you're just not going to work. You, you're out of mobile range. Live with it. You know, I had to get up to a uh, confirmation of floodwaters there. And I got to the flood water and roads, I went the back way, tried to get all around. And I looked at it and I thought, looked at the car, looked at the water, and I said, well, I don't, I'm not going to risk, I'm not going. You can't get there, flood waters cut you off. Live with it. You, you have to live with the limitations that the environment gives you. So you get used to saying, well, we can't do it. You just can't do it. Might be able to do it next week. So I think is that I think that's that's something that you have here. I have to cancel things. I can't get to them, or you know, pressures will ring up and say we can't come for confirmations. All right, so it's cancelled. Ring up and say, well, don't drive. The, yeah, they're nice. I tell you, don't drive six hours out here because no one will be there. That's very nice. <laughs> I'm glad they did. But I think in, we're used to having to accommodate and and deal with what we've got. And I know, coming from the land, you know, farmers are excellent. You know, well, if I can't do it this way, I'll do it that way. And you make do with what you've got. And I think that's important and that's where, you know, out here you learn, well, you haven't got control of everything. You hope your, your wheel's not going to fall off the car. You hope that's not going to happen. You do your best, but things happen. I'm just wondering, Johnny, whether um, in terms of... Uh Thinking back to the, the story we watched 
earlier in the in the day, your comment about farming has changed since you um, had depression and since you came through in recovery. Have, have you got something perhaps to help us to understand how your farming has changed in ways that perhaps were helpful? Well, you were talking about control um, just a minute ago. <coughs> um, and of course, we've done courses, my wife and I, about uh, business courses to help us better manage our business. and. Um, and the and the and the and our teachers say, well, just just worry about the things you can control and the things you can't control. Don't worry about them. Well, that's an obvious obvious lesson. Um, and of course, we can't control the weather, but we 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 do worry about the whether the crop's going to get half an inch just to bring up the last few seeds. Um, but we know not to to, to deliberate it. But but it's the grey areas, the things that we partially control. I mean, we can control getting up in the morning and starting the motorbike and going down, that's easy. But it's the, ones, it's the, it's the things that we can have partial control over and also um, um, that, that sort of uh, in terms of the bank balance um, and the overdraft, which worries farming families when they're rearing children, um, how much do we try to control? Do we work 24 hours a day? Do we do we bust our boiler to go up to up to Roma to buy cheap calves to bring them back because that's what we think is going to be a profitable enterprise? And and how hard do we work at that? And uh, <coughs> in those grey areas, making the decision on whether you whether you possibly jump at an opportunity to make an extra dollar with the hope that you do or and that trades off against being with your family or your children. They might be, um, they might be doing a school presentation, or they they might be playing sport, or they might be being confirmed. And you want to be at those things. And ha so, how do you trade? And how do you how do you get that balance? So, um, so for me, I think uh, you just have to say, well, we'll we'll bugger it. I'm not going to chase that dollar. Um, um, I'm going to go to town and be part of the community and, and make a contribution. I'm going to do the things with the family. But uh, it's easier said than done when you when you've when you have been working at something for 30 or 40 years and, and you look at the overdraft every second day and and you are worrying about, and you look at wheat prices in the land. Then you become your subconscious becomes. Um, conditioned to to worrying about that, and and when you try not to worry about it, you you become anxious, and the anxiety feeds can be. If you feed the anxiety, then that and and that leads to depression. And um, when when you are depressed and in, in in that state, the biology goes haywire, and and you can't just be lifted out quickly you, you need medication and you need uh, um, a lot of counseling to help rectify the biology but I'm probably getting off track a bit there but anyway that's that's what I yeah that's part of it anyway I wonder if we might um, ask our audience whether they've got some observations or questions that they might like to ask one of our speakers or themselves who knows just wondering, how do we create the spaces and the places which allows people to share their stories so as we can deepen the, and explore the reality of our spiritual lives? Do we have anyone here who's busting to answer that one or respond to that one? Do you want to have a go? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> there you go, Bishop. Just a, a, a quick one, and that's a, a really good question because it's nice to have all these these things, these ideas of the spiritual life, but how do you put them into practice in parishes or in little communities all over the place? And I don't know the exact answer to that, but um, I think one way it could start with having uh, stories like what, what we've got here, even using our lessons from the long paddock you know invite some friends around 
into your house, have a meal, maybe play a segment, do something like that, then have a conversation and get the stories from the people that are coming because I mean, this room would hold, I mean, could, could fill, we could have a four hour video sessions of people's stories. You've all got stories. But I think it's important to have, have a forum where you can all share. So probably I would think that, that that's, you know, it comes into my mind that, that maybe that's something you, you invite a few people around, maybe have something like one of these stories, play this, have a talk about it and does anyone, and just talk in a, in a, have a place where you feel comfortable to, to speak the things that, that are really deep and meaningful to you in a, in a safe environment where people aren't going to, to use what you say against you or laugh at you. I think that's important. You've got to have a, a trusting, a nurturing place to actually nurture your spirit. So that's the only thing I could think of that maybe that's a start we could do out here is to actually have start in someone's house or, or at some place just have a little group that might just want to t come together to and be invited to come together and talk on some spiritual things and, and share some stories of what it's like living out here. I, I think also at some level it takes a bit of guts to, to put it out there that um, you've got something to say. I mean, if I hadn't... Um, that's a fly. That's a very outback lesson from Long Paddock thing. I'll just pretend there's a few around. <laughs> Snake, sorry. Um, if Johnny hadn't, when I met Johnny first, if Johnny hadn't risked telling me that, um, that he'd suffered from depression, I wouldn't have known. Um, and there's something, I think, gutsy about us speaking our story. And with Dawn, if she hadn't um, offered to me something of her story when I first met her, we would never have had the conversation that we ended up having. Um, I would never have met Marianne. Um, at some point, I think there's a, a, a little bit of risk-taking once you're in a relationship, as Bishop says, where there's a bit of trust and, and you can risk it. But at some point, you've got to just sort of step up and say, you know, I don't know, it's a daggy thing to talk about, but um, how's your spiritual life? You know, that's the end of that friendship, gone. But, you know, not necessarily so. Obviously, it's not as blatant as that, but we might ask people a little more sometimes about... Um, what their life experience has been, or offer a little bit more, not not navel gazing, and you know, here I am, and here God, here she comes, she's going to tell us more about her life, you know, not not like that, but simply being prepared to um, to go to those conversations sometimes that are a little bit difficult, because what I've discovered in this you know fantastic adventure, which has been so far lessons from the long paddock, is what's most personal is also what's most universal, and the moment willing people. Um, give something from their personal lives, it, it opens up the most extraordinarily universal observations that, that go with some of the greatest of our classical spiritual writers. Um, and, you know, every now and then I've just had the urge to say, you know, that's exactly what Therese Lisieux said, you know, wow, well, who Kate? Who the, who's she? Oh, well, well, one of our greats, you know, and, well, how many greats have we got? Well, thousands of them. Um, it'd be wonderful to be able to, to use some of our own material to help people wonder about a spiritual tradition which is rich and, and very worth the effort. I'm wondering whether, um, Frank, you've got some thoughts mulling over there about anything in particular that we might um, segue to you. Need to well, just with the question that's been raised, I think that... No, I'm wired for sound. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I think, I mean, the great thing is we, we've heard people reflecting on their experiences. Now, all of you have had similar sorts of experiences, but what's critical is being able to reflect on those experiences and learn from them, and then to share about them. And I think a lot of the spiritual life is, at least I've always thought of it, it's just, it's trying to narrow that gap between the experience and the reflection on it, and it's being able to deepen it sufficiently that when you share the reflection on that experience, you see that it's not me acting, or it's not even so much me at the center of the story, it's the action of God through me uh, and in the world. And I was reflecting on this recently, I read something by the Australian novelist, Helen Garner, where people had been criticizing her because she so often would 
uh, write about other people's pain and anxiety, and you would have seen it where she writes about difficult court cases and that sort of thing. But she was reflecting that no, what she's trying to do is get inside the experience of the other, and she, as a writer, is trying to be absolutely attentive to their experience and that reflection on the experience. And I think that's a bit the spiritual type of journey, that we can be attentive to the action of God in our own lives and that of each other. And if I can put in a Jesuit uh, advertisement, because I'm a Jesuit, our founder was Ignatius Loyola, and his big insight was very simple. It was that if we do reflect on our reflection, we know that there are some things which cause us what he would call consolation, and there are other things which cause us desolation. And sometimes it's not, you know, it's not the fairy floss of life that causes the consolation. In fact, the fairy floss of life can even cause the desolation. And the consolation can come out of those long, hard years doing it tough in the bush or whatever, but the capacity to reflect on that and seeing the action of God and seeing that I am part of the bigger picture. I am part of God's story. And I think we've heard that from all four of you who have spoken, uh, that we come to see ourselves as something of the bigger picture. I'm going to go on a bit. I remember once there was a great uh, priest, John O'Leary, uh, John Leary, and he worked a lot up in Daly River with uh, Aboriginal people there, including Miriam Rose Ungama, who's reflected a lot on spirituality. But I remember John Leary once telling me he conducted this retreat for some of the Aboriginal people there, and they lived by the Daly River, and there was one fellow who never talked much. But one day he got this fellow to draw a picture, and the fellow drew a very simple picture the first day, which was of a stick figure of a man which just fitted inside a circle. And a couple of days later he came back and he drew another picture. This time it was, the circle was the same size, but the stick figure was only about half an inch tall. And this was reflecting a great spiritual insight of his place in the universe and his place in relationship with God wasn't daunting, it was actually consoling. So I think it's that reflection on experience which can then be shared in trust through spiritual conversation, which is what our four speakers have opened up for us today. Fantastic. Thank you, Frank. Um, is there other questions perhaps for other people here? Yes, I hope my question is relevant because it's to do with relevance. My question is, what does the church, and I mean the clergy, have to change to make the church more relevant? My second part to that question is, what does the church, meaning the people, have to do to go back to church? That's one of those moments when I'm going to flick to you, I think, one of the priests here. <laughs> what do the priests have to do? I knew the answer to that. We would have already done it. <laughs> I don't know what the easy answer to that would be. Um, from my perspective, I think for a start, um, the clergy, and, and I, I was single out because it was asked of the clergy, but I would include that to everyone, has to get back to being um, Jesus people and, and people that are authentically ministers of the good news to focus back on our core business of being Jesus to other people. Um, and for the clergy, that often means, and we've heard plenty of time, Pope Francis, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan of Pope Francis and his uh, ecclesiology of saying, well, a, a priest has got to um, have the smell of his sheep. A priest has got to be, the clergy has to get out and be with the, his people, the people, listen to the people and be a part of the people, not, not this separation. And I think that's a, that's a great difficulty that has arisen in the church that I've sort of seen, that you, to, to deal your relationship, you're a family, you're not, it's not sort of, you're the boss, they're the people, um, 
pay, pray and obey. That's your job. That's the people's job and the clergy there runs. They, they do their bit. You do your bit. We're a family together. And I think, I think that's important and that's a start for me. It's just, you know, I'd like to see the clergy of just being accessible that's, and, and being with the people. Go in little country towns, you know, I tell my priests, I says, well, yeah, there's a, if there's an Anzac, you go to it. If there's a thing at the club, you go to it. You go down to the pub, have a meal at least once a, once a night at the pub, talk to your people, a bunch of shearers, they go up and say good day interact, connect and I think that's, we talk about disconnection and people are disconnected with the church, well we've got to try and dis go out there and I think a lot of clergy have stopped even bothering about trying to connect with people and be with people and I think that's sort of sad and sometimes in our society today there's a bit of fear, how do you do it? Do people want me to connect with them? Do yeah, and there's, it's a it's not a simple answer, but I think that's for, for a start. Of, and then Pope says you don't want clericalism. You don't want, you know, I'm up here, you're down there. We're out, we're all baptised, and we all have particular roles, but with the body of Christ, you've got to work as a body together, and the clergy's got to love. Yeah, it's got to be. A, it's a love relationship. It's a family relationship. If you don't love your people. If you're not prepared to give your life for your flock, that's what Jesus expects. I think it starts there. If the clergy would be prepared, okay. Um, you talk to the clergy in Syria or Iraq and some of those. I happen to be good friends with the um, Archbishop Armel, who was the Archbishop of Mosul. And you hear stories about that, of the clergy actually when they come to execute, there are quite a few of them, to execute some of the, 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 the people that the clergy would go in and take, take the bullet for the people, would do anything to protect the people because they love their people. I think that's the root of a connection and I think we can learn from that. And for me personally, anyway, I think that's where it starts. There's all the extra yeah, political things and structural things can go around that, but unless there's that real, real belief and, and living out of that relationship of family um, that clergy love the people and the people love the clergy and you're a part of it, you're a part of one body, I don't think any of the other things are going to really work without that. Um, I'm, I might just make an observation about the second part of your question was what can we do as, as church to, to help that? I mean, again, I, I don't know, but um, the sort of obvious one is be there. And... Uh, some years ago I put together a little book that I think Frank had a part of too, which was Why I'm Still a Catholic. Um, and these days, boy, you know, are we ready for another book called Why Am I Still a Catholic? Because that's a serious question. And, and perfectly frankly, it's a question I ask myself every day. I became a Catholic. Uh, why do I stay a Catholic? And after the events of um, this last year, particularly with the Royal Commission uh, into Child Sexual Abuse, it's a, a big question. Our people belong in our church um, and see if we can't bring ourselves back to somewhere that, that really needs us desperately and, and not just for survival. I, th I think the world around us is looking for ritual and for all those things that go with rich liturgy and, and a spiritual tradition that matters. And um, if we're not there uh, building it and, and nurturing it again ourselves, then uh, I don't think it's going to be there to hand on to others. And that for me would be more than a sadness, that would be the deepest tragedy of all, that the story could quietly disappear for however length of time. I don't know that we could ever actually kill it because I think it's stronger than any of us, but a, a powerful need for community. So perhaps, I don't know, Dawn, maybe you want to say something about how, how community works for you. Or when the sisters was in Berkeley, when they was in Berkeley, they, uh, like we've got elders and everything there and disabled people who can't get to church. So they used to have the transport for them. Some of them used to come from um, Alice Edward Village, which is about six k's, ten k's or something from the church. And they pended up on the sisters to get them to church. And sometimes we used to go to Mary Ann and I used to go and pick some of the elders up now that the sisters gone. But they really did depend on the sisters to get to church. The other ones that could walk, they walked to church. 
but the others, we, you know, we really do need the sisters back at Burke if we can get them, because uh, not only for that, we've got kids in that for communion, get them ready for the early communion and things like that. Yeah, and as for the lady, they asked us, how are we going to get our people back? Well, all we do is just get a friendly gathering, maybe where they're drinking or whatever, and uh, have a bit of a yarn, and I get my message through from the songs and that that I, Catholic songs and that. They love that honey in the rock. They all sing that, whether they drunk, sober or what. But, <laughs> you, know, you know, they do. They really do. Yeah, but they, they get into it, you know. That's the only way you can get your message across sometime when they don't listen. And some of, some of my people just say, oh, we don't go to church because we, they take our people, you know, would pass away and things. Uh, we don't believe in him. Well, I said, you won't be, if you don't believe in one, you come back to church and it's all Catholic, you know. They, they was baptised in the Catholic church. So we're trying to get them back. So if you, if you find a way of getting them back, let me know, please. <laughs> I think it's really important to remember that, that we've people have drifted. Um, I think it was Carol, Lewis Carroll, that said that peop, don't just people just drift away. Nobody actively leaves the church. And I think that's really what we're dealing with, certainly where we're from. Um, and I think there's a there is a real sense in our more isolated places that they've been forgotten. Um, and I think we are very lucky, not to praise you up too highly, <laughs> but we're very lucky that we have a bishop that's willing to travel. And as soon as word of that gets out, you know, that that's a positive. You know, people feel that, that they're... Um, that they belong, that they are cared about, uh, that they matter. And I think that's a huge part of what will bring people back. Whether people come and be bums on seats again is a different matter. I, I, don't, I don't think the time has passed, but I think we may need to revisit what the church was like originally. You know, that smaller, smaller community, probably a little less ritualised. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just spinning here, but um, I, I do think it's that feeling of, of people caring. And I know in the back blocks, you know, well, Wanaring, the last time they had mass was when the bishop went out, what, 18 months ago? So we haven't had a priest out there, we haven't had, you know, I, I'll get to go next week, <laughs> yay. Um, but they, they notice that, those, the Catholics that are out there that have been looking for that sense of belonging, haven't had it for a long time. And I mean, there's lots of good reasons why there hasn't been a presence out there, but it's felt and we're feeling, you know, we're, we're seeing the, the product of that, I suppose. I wonder if there's another question out there. Um, and today I've been hearing a common theme and it's the respect for our first peoples um, spirituality and their, the way they cared for the land. Um, so I was just wondering what you think about the church incorporating more um, of our Aboriginal beliefs um, or rituals, as you were saying. I think coming from the bush, sometimes that upper class culture where like you were saying bishop at the liturgies where everything is perfect is is intimidating for somebody who hasn't grown up like that and you feel like the church is too good for you so what do you think about incorporating more yeah outside in the paddock services or getting together in little groups or i don't know investigating ways of doing those sorts of things Um, I think you're right on, Trish. I mean, the the way that that I sort of look at it in this diocese, and it's very much what are the needs in the of the particular people in the particular communities. So, for I'll give you an example of one of our communities at Wilcannia, for example, um, which is um, 
largely um, an Aboriginal community um, who had been brought to our attention, um, that, uh, and it's largely a Catholic community, that quite a number of the children in the school have not been baptised. But they, they consider themselves Catholics. They are because they haven't had, they didn't really realise, they'd forgotten the, the practice of getting baptised, they hadn't sort of done this. So, for example, there we said, well, what do we do here? Well, we go and, you know, do some preparation there for baptism and there's a thing with the, the people, they, they're not really keen on coming to the church except for funerals. So we're organising to have the baptism down at the river and to have a service down there. We're also looking, at, they're also looking, they would like to have a, uh, a, a sorry day service or a, a sorry for all the, the negative and the things that have happened in their community, an ecumenical service down the banks of the river as well. And the community has asked, you know, would the bishop come to that? I said, you're right. We'll go and wear all the clobber and all that, and that's going to mean a lot for, for those people. So that's a, an individual need for that community. Other communities where that need is there, yes. I mean, you do that. We, we are a little bit, which is great, um, we enjoy a bit of flexibility being this type of diocese as far as liturgically and other things, because what do you got? We make do with what we've got. And we can introduce and say, yes, you can have you can have a service outside. I mean, we have flexibility, for example, even in some things like um, weddings, you know. Um, yes, it's nice, you get married in the church, but if your church is a little wooden church with no air conditioning and it's 45 degrees and it's six hours from your house where you're going to come in from the station and you're going to do that, no problem, you don't get married in the church. You, you wouldn't. It's, the church is not capable, in a way, of providing that. So, so for, there's many reasons in our diocese where you have to make the well, okay, well, if you're going to have a station, where's your reception at the station? Well, we don't expect you to go six hours into the church to get married and then drive six hours back to have your reception back at your station, have your wedding at your station. It's common sense. So a lot of it is common sense. That's how I'd answer that. There's, like we have uh, the Aboriginal funerals, for example, that I've done in the communities that I've actually done from elders. I sort of sit down to it and I said, right, what would you like? What would you like? We'll have a look at that. And I said, well, I need to do that prayer. I need to do this here and I need to do that there. If you fill in the gaps, let's have a, let's have a talk about this. And they get to do it as, and, it, and I must say, the most beautiful funerals I've ever done. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's really surprising. And it's surprising, I'll just as an aside for our longer thing, when it's planned like that, the moments of silence. Before the funerals, silence. Want some quiet? No, silence. Dead silence. They like the dead silence. We don't like the dead song. We want to put on a tape quiet mute. No. The funeral director wants to, would you want some? No. They want dead silence. I've even had it when the funeral comes. Bishop, well, it's so silent. We, we want, you just need to play some music. No. <laughs> the people want dead silence. And it's good. Sometimes you have to convince people that, that this is what people actually want in that situation. So I suppose from my perspective here, it's what, what's needed in each particular community. We're very much open to do that. So the community get and go, so we'd encourage that, I suppose, is the, is the bottom line. In 1996, when Pope John Paul II came to Alice Springs and he said, the church in Australia will not be the church that Jesus wants her to be until you, the Aboriginal people, have made your contribution to her life and until that contribution has been joyfully received by others. So we've had the Roman license for this for a long time. How do we create community when people don't come to church? How do we create community when no one comes to church? Um, we sort of begun to answer that a little bit, haven't we? Around, you know, gathering people in different ways and, and Dawn was saying, you know, she'll gather people down around the, the riverbank there sometimes and have a bit of a yarn, get the 
the guitar out. Uh, Johnny was sort of pointing to it and his story around um, you know, coming into town for whatever it is that it might be going on and Bishop saying to the race meetings, you know, whatever it is that draws us to be in community with people, I suppose, is, is the way we gather again as, as community. Um, I think it's, it's, again, it's about just being aware of my need for it. Um, and in our world, sometimes it's harder than it used to be to remember that I need to create community rather than just to, you know, assume that it's going to be there for me. Uh, and that's one part of the changes that I think uh, Mary Ann was pointing to in her reflection about, you know, times have changed, but people's needs haven't. So we, we're going to have to sort of more consciously think about what our needs are and our deepest longings are still what they always were. Uh, how do I create a way for me to, to begin to get down to meeting that? I think also we have that a little bit in a way easier if you go to those meeting places in the city which often doesn't it's a lot more difficult to actually connect with people sometimes in the city than even out here as far as the church goes but I mean a lot of people are a little bit reticent or afraid even in the country to 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 launch out and and initiate it I mean you go into a pub um, my, my latest one, I won't tell you where because it's not too far away. You, you go into the pub and you come up to, and you, you go, hey, how you going? You start to talk. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, priest. I said, oh, now I'm, I'm the bishop. Of Ken well, can you afford me? And, and the response was, but, you, know, you got a bugger of a job. <laughs> and I said, oh, it's not too bad. We sit there. But you have a talk, and by the end of it, you've got six people having a yarn, and, and some people, yeah, and they, they'll ask you and talk about these questions. And, oh, I can't fix that. And often, you, you're out there. You've got to put it out there. If people don't want to talk, you don't, well, no way. I can, I, I, when I'm dead and buried, which the road I'm going is not going to be for yeah, sooner than later, I want to get up to the burly gates. And St Peter said, what are you doing? Well, I went down to the pub. I was there. I went to the races. I went there. Led Anzac Day. Played the bagpipes out there. I was out there. I put it out there. This is the gospel. It's out there. If people took it, took it up, on, well, that's, fine. that's their business. I can't force people to come and believe. But I've got to put it out there. If people can respond and you can touch people, then that's well and good. Sometimes we're afraid to put it out there. And I think that's that's sad because for me, and, and I would imagine for anyone, for just your general Catholics and ministers or whatever, must be very sad to the end of the week, a Friday, what have I done? No, nothing. I, I, I walked out of my presbytery twice. And that was just to go and get the paper and the milk. And I went back and sit there and watched Foxtel for the rest of the time. And did mass, twi two masses. Oh, what, what a terrible life that would be. At least you have a crack and you get out there and have a go. And I think we should never be afraid. I mean, Christ was never afraid to go out and have a go. Um, we're not perfect. That's the thing. You can't expect perfections. And do we, do, we have, do we have all the answers? No, I don't. But what you can do, you go out and do and you try your best. You have a go. That's another thing I think that's uh, particularly a country thing. You don't weigh up and think, oh, no, well, is it worth going out there? There's only 20 people. No. Well, have a go. It doesn't work. You've had a go. But don't sit back and just say it's too hard and we won't do anything. I mean, that's very defeatist. And I don't think that's, a, that's an attribute that I've found in, in my diocese in the country that defeatist attitude. We're optimistic people. So, yeah, we've got problems, we've got this problem. We can, I can give you pages of problems. I've got a whole flaming office full of them down there if you want to have a look at them. A lot of problems. OK, yeah, well, they're, they're not going to... But what are you doing? What's the positive things here? And we've got something and we've got to hold on to those and be looking for the positive, not getting into the, the rut of just being weighed down by all the problems and just looking at the negatives. Negatives are always going to be put in front of us. Where do we find some positives? So I think we've got to be, Christians have to be optimistic because we, we peddle hope, don't we? Isn't that what we're all on about, hope? On, um, when Father Murray was alive and Father Ebert, they used to go out and have they to people place and take the mass out to them when they couldn't make it. So that was another thing. And it was really good because the... My people used to welcome in them into the, the yards and not to have the church. 
had an open in that. Yeah, really good. We got maybe a couple more questions, or one more question perhaps. So how do we ensure we nurture this spirituality, create the space, the time, um, to, for our young people um, in, with the tension of the world, um, but make sure we nurture this precious gift that our diocese offers us? I feel passionately about education and about Catholic education in particular. and. I tell you, one of the things that galls me more than anything is to see some Catholic schools just as hectic and crazy busy as any other school. Um, if Catholic schools aren't places where reflection can happen, where children have play time, you know, just to play, in order to have leisure time, in order there to be reflective time, in order for there to be discernment going on, um, these things can't happen if their lives are chock-a-block full. And one of the saddest things happening in education, you know, as, and I'm a teacher's background, is that our schools are just sort of microcosms of the world around us, that it just has become so busy and so chock-a-block full of doing, doing, doing all the time. I've come from a teaching background. Um, I think the greatest gift that a Catholic school can give to the parish community is to have enthusiastic teachers. Teachers who are faithful people, um, who understand, truly understand the important role that they have in their communities. In our communities where church isn't a part of people's lives, and this is from the majority of Catholics, I know in our town, the majority of Catholic kids, church isn't part of their, their life. So the school becomes even more important in, in the role that they have within the parish. And it's critical that the, that the teachers in our schools understand that they have been given this gift of the parish children and they, they are in a position to play such an important part in these children's lives and in their families' lives. And for these children and families, the school is often the only face of the church that, the, that they see. So if there's any doubt in the minds of our teachers or if our teachers aren't prepared themselves well enough in their own or strong enough in their own faith, that witness isn't, isn't there in our community. And for, as a parish person, um, I, I think it's, it's really sad that that's not a, a, an absolute priority because I, I really think it needs to be. Thanks. I'm very conscious of time and we're going to need to uh, start to wrap up. And I'm also conscious that there are so many more questions, but um, that's a good thing. It's a great thing that we've got more questions than we can handle because hopefully we can um, grasp some of those questions and bundle them up and have them um, become a part of an ongoing conversation, which Lessons from the Long Paddock is going to be an ongoing conversation. With a bit of luck, uh, we'll have funding for s sort of uh, round two of Lessons from the Long Paddock. Um, I'd like to thank you all for being a part of this conversation, our very first Lessons from the Long Paddock, and uh, I'm hoping that we can go out on some of the um, outtake uh, material that went with our experiences of gathering these stories. I'd really love to thank... Um, Kylie couldn't be here from uh, out north of um, Burke, but um, thank Kylie, Johnny and Marianne and Dawn for coming all the way to be with us here today, to be a part of this conversation, reflecting with us. And uh, we'll go on reflecting when the cameras stop because that's part of what we'll do. And I know Dawn's got her guitar, so we could end up having a bit of a party here, which would be terrific. Um, but we'll head off now and thank you all enormously, so much for being a part of us. Thank you.
Once you got to be going, I said. You're doing silly in the words like I'm guessing the next word is. You know what you do, don't you? Good day again. I'm back. I hope you really enjoyed Lessons from the Long Paddock. If you have found something beneficial to your own spiritual lives from this experience, please let us know. And if we get some good feedback, we'd love to put it on next year for you. So please let us know. And remember again, if you'd like to donate to help myself and my team at Wilcannia Forbes, go to our webpage, find that red bell, click on it and make a donation. God bless you.